Good afternoon, and welcome to today's industry-presented webinar, The Neuromuscular Basis of Resistance Training, What's New? Today's webinar is presented by Technogym. Technogym is a world leader in the fitness and wellness solutions sector and has equipped more than 65,000 wellness centers and more than 100,000 homes worldwide. An estimated 35 million people use Technogym products every day in more than 100 countries. Today's webinar presenter is Professor Narici. Professor Narici is a muscle physiologist with more than 30 years experience and more than 200 papers in skeletal muscle research. He has been a professor in clinical physiology at University of Nottingham, research fellow at the National Research Council of Italy, Master of Education in Research at the University of Geneva in Switzerland, and is a past president of the European College of Sport Science. Professor Narici has been a pioneer in the study of human muscle, architectural, neuromuscular, and tendinous adaptations with strength training, detraining, and aging. His current research interests are the age-related changes of the neuromuscular junction, the effects of chronic inactivity on the neuromuscular system, and the mechanisms of skeletal muscle remodeling in response to unloading and overloading in humans. It is with great pleasure that we present to you, Professor Narici. Thank you. It's a real pleasure to be here today and to, be, to have the chance to speak on the skeletal muscle adaptation to uh, over concentric and eccentric overloading. Before I focus on the main topic of the talk, I think it is useful to reiterate some key concepts about muscle mechanics. As most of you know well, a muscle um, can develop force during shortening and lengthening. This is described by the, what we call the force-velocity relationship. There is distinct differences uh, in, in the mechanical output during shortening and and uh, lengthening. As shortening velocity increases, the shorter the time in which myosin can bind to actin, the lesser the number of cross bridges are formed, and the higher is the rate of cross bridges detach which are detaching. And so this is why the force decreases with the velocity of shortening. Instead, when the muscle is lengthening, the myosin head behaves in a different, completely different way from the shortening phase as it is stretched. And one fragment of the myosin molecule, the S2 fragment, uh, becomes uh, stretched. And as it is stretched, develops force be, by re resisting stretching. There is a, also another protein which is involved in uh, um, the stretching of the muscle. And this has been recently discovered and it's called titan. Titan, titan behaves as a spring, which resists elongation and stores elastic energy, which is then released during the shortening phase. So this is the, um, the key features of the force-velocity relationship. One other important aspect of the force-velocity relationship is that each point along the force-velocity curve should belong, by definition, to the same level of neural activation. If we change the activation, we move to another force velocity curve. Also, one key feature about uh, shortening and lengthening contraction is that uh, they differ in terms of energy cost. This concept dates back to early work uh, performed in the UK um, by Bigland, Ritchie, and, uh, and Woods. In fact, what they uh, uh, developed at the time was uh, this system of two bicycles uh, in which one, in one case, the subject uh, pedaled in the normal way, so pushing forward the pedals. And on the, in the opposite bicycle, one subject was resisting, so was braking the the concentric action, the pulling action of the other cyclist. And they measured uh, oxygen uptake during the two kinds of work, during the positive and the negative work. 
Well, during positive work, the uh, oxygen uptake was much greater, meaning that more energy was consumed as compared to the um, negative work in which the subject was breaking. For this, and this is true for any given work output. For, so for any given work output, the energy cost of uh, negative work, that is to say of eccentric work, is lower than the concentric work. Uh, and in fact, uh, this is also shown by uh, and confirmed by the EMG activity, which is shown here. If we record EMG activity during <clears throat> the positive and negative work, you can see that the EMG activity for the same level of um, work output is lower during negative work as compared to uh, positive work. And more recently, um, the advantages of uh, negative work have found important clinical applications. There are many of these, but one, for instance, is an application uh, on the elderly uh, to combat frailty. And this in, the, in this particular study published by Lastaio and colleagues, they found that uh, um, when subject trained, uh, this was an 11-week train training study, when subjects trained using concentric contraction, there was a much greater increase in strength compared to the training with the, uh, with the conventional training system. In other words, with a concentric and an eccentric phase. And this was also reflected by a different hypertrophy. The subjects that trained with eccentric contractions were able to hypertrophy more compared to the subjects that trained with conventional concentric eccentric training. So this is strong uh, evidence that uh, eccentric exercise, if performed at the right intensity, activating uh, a, a high number of motor units can be more effective than concentric training. And also, uh, this is uh, reflected also by uh, analyzing the several papers that have been published in the literature. This is um, a meta-analysis of um, the benefits of concentric and eccentric training in terms of muscle hypertrophy. And you can see that the prevailing evidence is, to, is for eccentric contraction as compared to the uh, eccentric contraction, uh, as compared to the concentric contractions. So in other words, eccentric training leads to greater hypertrophy as compared to concentric training, provided that sufficient neural drive is obtained. But one key um, difficulty with uh, concentric and eccentric training as performed with conventional strain training machines is that it is not possible to fully recruit motor units during the eccentric phase. And this is because what is typically done, you uh, lift a weight, you raise it to the maximum displacement of the weight. So once the weight reaches the maximum, in order to lower the same weight, we have to forcibly to de-recruit motor units. If we do not do, if we do not do that, the weight will simply stay at the top. This is exactly what is shown here. You can see this is the concentric phase when the, for, when the weight is lifted. Here's the maximum displacement. So the, here the weight reaches the maximum height. And here it is lowered. So this is the concentric phase and this is the eccentric phase. This is the lifting and this is the lowering of the weight. You can see what it means in terms of motor units here. We have to recruit motor units during the lifting, but in order to lower it, we have to de-recruit motor units. This is its absolute EMG. If we quantify EMG by integrating the EMG signals, which is this signal here, you can see that the EMG increases during the concentric phase and decreases during the eccentric phase. This is absolutely necessary to lower the weight. In other words, if we uh, now um, try to explain this behavior in terms of force-velocity relationship, this is what happens. This is the force-velocity relationship that uh, exemplifies this condition. So we are lifting a load, 
at a certain velocity concentrically. So we are here on this curve. But th because the same absolute load is lowered, we move from this velocity curve to this velocity curve. And this velocity, velocity curve is at a lower level of neural activation, so lower EMG. If instead we were to use the same force velocity curve, we would have to increase the load in order to move along the same level of neural drive. So we wouldn't have to de-recruit motor units. So this is a main disadvantage of uh, conventional strain training machines, that in order to lower the weight, we have to de-recruit motor units. So whereas we uh, uh, re reach a decent level of activation during the concentric phase, we, we have to lower the number of motor units in order to lower the weight. We also know, according to the Henneman size principle, that motor units are uh, recruited according to the size. So at low strength levels, we recruit small motor units with, which have low uh, threshold of activation. If once in, we increase the strength, we have to recruit motor units of greater size and so on until we, re we reach motor units a very high level of activation, of threshold of activation, and of, of very large size. These are difficult to, re to recruit. So in, in other words, what we should aim when we train is to recruit all pool of motor units. We shouldn't perform a set of contraction, recruiting one pool, and then switching off some motor units during the two movement phases. So we should exploit the Henneman size principle during the training. Also, another <clears throat> key aspect to bear in mind that the recruitment of motor units not only varies with the load, but also with the velocity. And this, again, has been shown many years ago, but I think it's important to uh, emphasize this point because, because this is exactly what we're doing every day when we train in the gym. So. Um, you can see that this is the integrated EMG activity, and this is the load. So as we increase the load, um, we obviously have to recruit more motor units, so EMG activity increases. But if we take the same load and we move it at a higher and higher velocity, you can see that EMG activity increases. In other words, to move the load faster, we have to recruit an increasing number of motor units. So our objective when we train should be to um, use high loads with the maximum velocity of movement to enable to recruit as many motor units as possible. So exploiting both mechanisms, both recruitment in terms of load and recruitment in terms of velocity. We, um, try to overcome the limitations uh, found in conventional strain training machines. Um, a few years ago, when we performed a study using a Technogym, a Technogym strain training machine, but in which we applied a, an electric winch. Uh, we had two groups of uh, elderly subjects. One group co trained conventionally, so lifting and lowering the load using a leg press machine. Uh, the other group was doing only eccentric load. We could do so because the wi electrical winch was doing the concentric, concentric phase for them. So the, the load was lifted by the electric winch while the subject then performed the eccentric phase. So one group ex trained only eccentrically and one group trained concentrically and eccentrically. Training lasted for uh, 14 weeks. Uh, we had 19 volunteers, as I said, one group trained eccentrically, concentrically, and one group trained eccentrically only. Training was performed three times per week, and the load was 80% of the concentric R, uh, 5RM and 80% of the eccentric 5RM. Uh, in the eccentric 5RM, the load once was set to 1.4 higher than the conventional uh, eccentric concentric group. So they were trained, they were doing the eccentric uh, contraction at a load which was 1.4 uh, 
higher than the concentric eccentric group. And, but training volume was the same for both groups. And we measured muscle architecture in terms of fascicle length and penetration angle, as shown here. This is a typical ultrasound image showing the length of fascicles, and it is the penetration angle, which are two parameters that um, are very sensitive to muscle hypertrophy. They, they uh, change very rapidly. And also we measure muscle thickness in the, in the uh, human vastus lateralis muscle. And these are the results we obtained. Uh, both, first of all, let's consider what happened to uh, muscle thickness. Uh, this is the eccentric group before training, eccentric group after training, concentric group before training, concentric group after training. As you can see, both groups are petrified to the same, um, to the same uh, 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 entity both 11%, but what is noteworthy is that the pattern of muscle hypertrophy was completely different in the two cases. In the, in the case of uh, the eccentric contra contraction, there was no change in penetration angle, uh, but there was a great increase in fascicle length. Whereas in the case of the concentric eccentric exercise, there was a very large increase in uh, penetration angle and little increase uh, uh, <coughs> instead for the eccentric group. So it looks as if um, concentric and eccentric exercise differ distinctly uh, in terms of uh, muscular adaptations, morphological adaptations. What I'm saying is this, I tried to, uh, uh, summarize this point with uh, this scheme, which um, shows a muscle before training and this after training. You can obtain the same gain in volume either by adding sarcomeres, uh, which are the building blocks of the muscle, either in series or in parallel. So what seems to happen is that eccentric training seems to favor the addition of sarcomeres in series, whereas concentric training seems to lead to a uh, muscle growth by ad adding sarcomeres in parallel. But the overall gain in muscle volume is the same, just a different deposition uh, uh, of sarcomeres inside the muscle. And why is this happening? This is happening simply because of the different mechanical stimulus that muscle fibers are uh, receiving. Uh, during eccentric exercise, as shown here, you can see that the fascicles, the muscle fiber fascicles, are stretched much more than during concentric exercise. So this muscle stretch is the stimulus for making the muscle grow longitudinally. So by uh, is, is a stimulus for adding sarcomeres in series. Whereas uh, in a concentric exercise, you can see the penetration angle increases a lot, where, whereas it doesn't increase with uh, eccentric training. And this is why penetration angle increases more with uh, concentric exercise. So you can see that the architectural adaptations to concentric and eccentric training are dramatically different. But of course, we wanted to know, we wanted to understand the mechanisms behind these adaptations. So we organized another strength training study, this time for 10 weeks, in which we had two groups of subjects. One group, again, trained concentrically and the other group trained uh, eccentrically. In this case, we had pure concentric and then in the other case, we had pure eccentric training. And uh, as we noted, noted before, the gaining muscle volume after 10 weeks of training was, the sim was similar between the two modes, but there was a greater increase in fascicle length with eccentric training and, um, and a greater increase in, pe in penetration angle with concentric training. Uh, so again, uh, confirmation that uh, there are different morphological changes induced by concentric and eccentric training. And uh, we took muscle biopsies 
to, to look for, for um, mechanisms uh, underlying these adaptations. And we found that uh, eccentric training um, seems to uh, activate map, different MAP kinases, which are signaling pathways that regulate uh, muscle growth, the direction of muscle growth, in a different way than concentric training. You can see that activation of these MAP kinases, P38 and ERK12, are much greater, um, activated much greater by concentric, eccentric training than concentric training. So we can see that eccentric training uh, relies on the, on the activation of different signaling pathways which control uh, this, dif this different muscle growth. So the different muscle growth is explained by activation of the, the different molecular pathways. And this is also confirmed by um, a different gene expression uh, between uh, length, uh, uh, shortening and lengthening contraction. This study here shows that uh, when you train uh, with lengthening contraction, you activate a different set of genes than, you, than when you train with a shortening contraction. So this is a concentric training and this is eccentric training. So again, also at the gene level, there is a, a different expression of these genes induced by the two forms of exercise. Recently, Technogym introduced a new machine. And this machine, this set of machines are, are called BioStrength. This is a new, new strength training line, which affords new um, modes of training uh, using a motor that can be totally programmed to, um, uh, to uh, enable to uh, achieve different training modes. This little uh, uh, film will be able to show you this concept. So the machines obviously are fully programmed. They, they can be set to the subject and some characteristics. And uh, uh, the motor of the machine can uh, be uh, fully programmed to, to make it adapt to the, to the particular mode which is uh, desired by the training protocol. In our study, uh, we use a, a leg press machine, as shown here, uh, and uh, which can be programmed is either using isotonic contraction, conventional isotonic contractions, viscous contractions, isotonic contraction with an eccentric overload, and elastic contractions. The isotonic contraction um, involves a cam, which enables to achieve a muscle tone, which is felt by the muscle, uh, in a constant fashion. So the muscle, the muscle load is constant throughout the range of motion. This is very important because obviously we want to maintain the load constant throughout the, um, the movement. And this is achieved by this special cam, which is, uh, follows uh, the anatomy of the joint. And uh, what is important to note is that the user can choose the weight for the, differently for the concentric phase and the eccentric phase. And this is very important because if we want to overload the muscle, we can uh, uh, use a different load, a greater load for the eccentric phase. Also, the, the machine basically learns the pace of the subject. This, this is um, uh, learned by the machine during the warm up. And so uh, during which the subject is invited to move at his um, habitual um, pace. And so the machine then reproduces this pace as the subject wishes. Um, instead, the viscous mode uh, is a new type of training, which is extremely interesting because it's like um, moving against uh, a liquid. It's like running in water with a different densities. Uh, so the, if we run very slowly, we will not encounter any resistance. But if we, the faster we run, the greater the resistance we will um, uh, encounter. And this is this this uh, principle is extremely useful because um, 
by moving at a high speed and a high uh, uh, density, uh, a, a visc a viscosity, we can uh, train with a very important load. But also, uh, the subject can uh, um, move at, at a speed which is comfortable for him. And this is particularly suited for uh, uh, rehabilitation in which perhaps uh, there is a joint pain. And so the subject is able to adjust the speed according to uh, the non-pain uh, zone. Uh, so to achieve a comfortable, achieving a comfortable uh, contraction. The last mode is, uh, elast is the elastic mode. This is basically um, exercising against a, a, an elastic uh, of which we can change the stiffness. So um, the machine comes with different settings and so you can choose the setting which basically imposes the stiffness of the elastic. So the higher is the stiffness, the greater is the um, resistance to stretch that the subject will encounter. Um, and so the, um, this type of, uh, uh, typically this type of contraction uh, is based on the fact that like an elastic, uh, the more you, um, um, you move, the, the greater will be the movement, the greater will be the resistance that you find during uh, the, um, the, the excursion. And uh, so we had the, the opportunity of uh, applying this machine in a recent study uh, by uh, investigating the level of neural drive uh, during exercise performed with, this, with the leg press uh, using overloading uh, as afforded by these new training machines. So we were able to overload the uh, muscle during the eccentric phase um, as compared to the conventional type of train. So we choose, um, this is a pilot study in which we trained, which we exercised 10 males. They were training with the leg press biostrength machine. And the load that we chose for the eccentric phase was 1.5 fold of the concentric load. And uh, the reason why we chose 1.5 fold is because we tried several um, coefficients uh, from 1.1 to 1.5. And we, we found that with 1.5 fold of the concentric load, we could achieve the same EMG level of the concentric mode. So we were traveling along the same force velocity relationship I was describing earlier. The time of detention that we used was 3131. In other words, three seconds for the eccentric phase, one second for the isometric phase, three seconds for the concentric phase, and one second for the isometric phase. And we recorded the MG activity using a biopack system. <clears throat> so the protocol consisted of, first of all, of a warm up uh, in which uh, there was the eval evaluation of the 1RM using the 5RM, the 1RM was estimated on the, uh, from the 5RM, uh, and this was followed by a familiarization using uh, uh, 12 sets of six, uh, six repetitions with a uh, 1.5 minutes rest in between. Then this was followed by, uh, on a different day, by a warm-up, uh, and then the, train, the training protocol, which consisted of one set of six repetitions with five minutes rest. Effectively, we, did, we performed um, two sets of uh, um, conditions. So the first condition was, was uh, <clears throat> isotonic uh, concentric eccentric training uh, at 70% 1RM. So, so this was the conventional uh, absolute load um, isotonic training. And then we performed the uh, eccentric training with 70% of the 1RM with the load, which is 1.5 times higher the concentric phase. And the same was applied for the 80% of the 1RM. So we, we performed the 80% of the 1RM conventionally, so with the eccentric and concentric phase. And then this was followed by the uh, concentric and eccentric phase, but with the eccentric 
potentiated by 1.5 the, uh, the concentric load. In fact, uh, this uh, um, eccentric uh, pot uh, potentiated eccentric place is called uh, eccentric plus. We recorded EMG activity during each contraction, as shown here, which uh, the, here is the raw EMG activity of the human vastus lateralis muscle, and this is the same signal which has been integrated. So each contraction was uh, analyzed in terms of EMG using 300 milliseconds windows, and, and, the, and then on the basis of the integrated EMG, we were able to quantify the EMG activity representing neural drive. And these are the results we obtained, uh, for, both for the 70% 1RM and both and the one and the 80% 1RM. <clears throat> effectively, you can see that when this is EMG activity expressed as EMG normalized to the concentric uh, co condition. So when you perform the concentric eccentric uh, exercise uh, using the conventional uh, mode, in other words, with the same uh, load between the concentric and eccentric phase, you can see that the EMG activity was uh, less than one, so less than, during the eccentric phase was less than one, so it, it was lower, so it meant, it meant that it was lower than the EMG of the eccentric phase. Whereas when we perform the same eccentric concentric uh, movement using the potentiated um, <clears throat> uh, eccentric phase, you can see that the EMG activity of the eccentric phase was the same as that of the concentric phase. So there was no direct recruitment of motor units. And this was true both this, for the 70% 1RM and true for the 80% 1RM. This, com this concept is also clear when we look at uh, um, these, these graphs here, which show the EMG activity in, term, in absolute terms, we show that during the conventional training, uh, the uh, EMG activity uh, <clears throat> with uh, the same absolute load in the eccentric phase is lower than the concentric phase. So in other words, is, this is exactly what I said before. If you use the same absolute load during the eccentric phase, the MG activity will be lower because we haven't increased the load to recruit more motor units. This is true both for, for the 70% 1RM and the 80% 1RM. But if instead we increase 1.5 fold the eccentric load during eccentric contraction, you can see that the eccentric EMG activity is ex absolutely the same as the concentric phase. So there is no de recruitment of motor units when we use in the concentric phase a load which is 1.5 fold greater than the concentric phase. So in other words, uh, using the, um, this combination uh, of uh, the 1.5 fold greater eccentric load, we were able not to lower the load at this lower activation, but we were able to exploit fully the force velocity curve. We were able, to, therefore, to train along this curve. So reaching this level of neural activation during the eccentric phase. So both the concentric and the eccentric phase were performed at the same level of neural activation with no the recruitment of motor units. And this is a, a main key finding. The other uh, mode which we uh, investigated was exercising against the viscous resistance. So, so using the viscous mode of uh, the biostrength machine. And <clears throat> as I mentioned before, the um, effort that the subject is uh, uh, experiencing increases with the uh, s speed of movement. So if you move very slowly, which are shown here in the black lines, uh, the EMG activity will be low, but the faster you move, the EMG activity, EMG activity will increase simply because for moving, by, uh, for moving faster, you have to recruit more motor units. And this, of course, is true for increasing 
levels of uh, um, viscosity coefficient. So the more viscous the liquid becomes, so the greater is the viscous resistance that the subject faces during the contraction, the greater is the number of motor units he will have to recruit. So uh, recruitment also increases as a function of the of the uh, viscosity. So in other words, if we want to uh, maximize training, uh, the, benef the benefits of training using the viscous mode, we have to use a high viscous setting with a high velocity of movement. But of course, what is also not worth it to, uh, to point out is that a subject instead that is not able to move at a high speed will still reach decent levels of EMG activity using low to medium settings. So this is why this mode is also interesting for uh, rehabilitation. So when we are re trying to rehabilitate patients. The other mode that we tried was the um, elastic mode. So um, the elastic mode basic, basically um, <clears throat> shows us that uh, the uh, effort increases with the um, with the stiffness of the elastic. So the, the, the stiffer is the elastic, uh, the greater it will be the effort that the subject has to put in to stretch the elastic. And so um, if we do that from low to high, obviously, uh, the EMG activity will increase as a function of the stiffness of the elastic. This is, again, EMG activity. You can see that the EMG activity is much lower during the low stiffness as compared to the high stiffness. But also, as I mentioned before, it increases also with the speed. So the, uh, the faster you move, the, fast, the greater will be the increase in EMG. So there again, we have these two concepts, speed and, and uh, force. So uh, if you want to re recruit a large number of motor units, you have to choose uh, a high stiffness. In other words, you have to put a lot of a strength uh, in the effort, but uh, you'll have to move fast to recruit a high number of motor units. And this is true not only for the concentric mode, but also for the eccentric mode. The one that, that I just described before was the uh, concentric mode, and this is the elastic uh, eccentric mode. So at this time we are resisting the um, the, uh, the elastic load during the, the eccentric movement, but the, the same principle applies. So the EMG activity increases as a function of stiffness and as a function of the speed of movement. So to conclude, I think um, I showed you that if we uh, train with an overload, we can achieve a greater EMG activity. And this basically follows the concept of the force velocity relationship. Using the biostrength machine, which is, uh, has been introduced by Technogym, by imposing a 150% eccentric overload, we achieve a 30% higher EMG activity. So 30% higher neural drive. And this is a major benefit in terms of uh, training purposes. So the, the leg press and biostrength enables to muscle loading at the same level on neural drive, both for the concentric and the eccentric phase. In other words, there is no the recruitment of motor units as normally find in conventional azotonic loading. And this, to our opinion, it, it is a useful resource, resource for supporting research and training studies. As far as training with viscous exercise, we can see that uh, muscle activation increases with raising viscosity and velocity. And, and viscous load, in this case, only applies to the, only to the concentric phase. Uh, there is no overload in, in the eccentric phase, but the viscous load seems seem particularly useful uh, for rehabilitation of patients as well. Uh, of course, training for athletes, but I think it is also useful for patients. Muscle activation elastic exercise increases with stiffness and velocity. 
And this applies both to the concentric and eccentric phase. Again, this is an interesting form of training. Um, it uh, enables to uh, use speed and uh, uh, stiffness. And uh, this, we can see that uh, we can achieve high levels of uh, activation uh, by playing with these two factors. And in conclusion, the biostrength machines seem particularly effective for maximizing neural drive during shortening and lengthening contractions performed in isotonic, viscous, concentric only, and elastic mode. Thank you very much. And now I'm welcome questions. Is there any thought of using equipment in microgravity setting? This is a, the question is, is there any thought of using this equipment in microgravity settings? This is very interesting because um, this particular machine uh, basically imposes the resistance with a motor. So we, we are not actually lifting weights. It, it, we, it is the motor which, which is imposing the loading. And so uh, this was a major hindrance in uh, uh, tr trying to strain train in the space. Obviously in space, we cannot use weights. Uh, so this, this uh, technology machine could potentially be very interesting for the microgravity environment because it is based on a motor and uh, it affords different modes of contraction, which could be particularly useful in this special environment enabling uh, astronauts to train uh, with, um, with high loads also during the uh, eccentric phase, which so far has not been possible with conventional uh, isotonic machines. The next question is, what is the effect of eccentric overload on muscle strength? Well, uh, the, the effect of um, eccentric overload on muscle strength uh, is uh, to produce a greater muscle gain. So effectively, uh, if we are able to uh, achieve a greater muscle recruitment, the benefits in terms of uh, um, muscle size and in terms of muscle strength should be greater. Uh, and so this is a, is a major benefit because uh, so far uh, the previous machines, the previous conventional machines did not give us this possibility. The next question is, which is the main advantage of using the biostrength leg press over traditional leg press machines? Well, this is exactly what, uh, uh, thank you for the question, but this is exactly the, uh, what I was emphasizing. Uh, conventional leg press machines uh, only enable us to train with the same absolute load during the concentric and eccentric phase. And as I explained, a limitation of this approach is that whereas you recruit many motor units during the concentric phase, if, if you don't have the possibility of overloading during the eccentric phase, you'll have to de-recruit motor units to lower the same weight, absolute weight. Instead, with the um, biostrength machine, we can overload the eccentric phase, achieving a greater recruitment of motor units as compared to the concentric phase, enabling us to work on the same force velocity relationship. Could you explain again how viscous contraction work? Yes, basically viscous contractions um, are based on movement against a fluid. The uh, closest analogy that I can find is running in water. So if you are trying to run in a pool or in the sea, 
you will experience that if you run very slowly or if you move more, very slowly, you'll find running easy. But if you're trying to run as fast as you can, uh, you will find it difficult because you will meet the resistance of the fluid. And just imagine if instead of running in uh, uh, water, you're running in oil, oil is much denser than water, you will find it much more difficult to move. And this is exactly what happens when you train with viscous um, uh, contractions, with uh, viscous machines. You can change the viscosity, so deciding whether you can train with a uh, low load or with a greater viscosity with a higher load. And as I mentioned before, the, uh, this depends on the velocity you use. So the idea is to try to move as fast as possible to encounter the resistance of the fluid. The next question is, what is the benefit of increasing pinational angle rather than fascicle length? This is um, interesting. Uh, I can explain that uh, in these terms. Uh, Penetration angle is a natural strategy that our body uses for packing a greater number of contractile elements, that is to say sarcomeres, along the same tendon length. So because the aponeurosis the tendon length is set anatomically, the only way we can pack more material is by increasing penetration angle. And so when you train, penetration angle increases simply because of a geometrical effect. You are packing more contractile material in a closed space, so the only way you can do that is by increasing penetration angle. So by increasing the, the angle at which fibers are inserted to, with respect to the tendon plate. So, um, in other words, when, when we increase penetration angle, we increase the cross-sectional area of the muscle. We increase the number of sarcomeres placed in parallel. And the force depends on the number of sarcomeres in parallel. Now, instead, the fascicle length, instead, depends on the number of sarcomeres in series. And this, uh, this sets the velocity of contraction of the fiber. So longer fibers, that is to say fib fibers that have more sarcomeres in series, are able to, to, uh, to contract at a faster velocity than shorter fibers. So if we increase fascicle length, we increase the speed of the muscle. If we increase penetration angle, we increase the strength of the muscle. Now, when we train, we increase both, but concentric, concentric training increases more Penetration angle, where eccentric training increases more um, uh, fascicle length. I hope I, I explained that clearly. Would the use of biostrength leg press be beneficial for 70 to 95 old people? Absolutely, for uh, various reasons. First of all, this machine is fully programmable. So you can, uh, you're not confined to a set of weights that you will find in a gym. You can set the, the training load precisely on what you want um, on a continuous scale. Uh, also, you can train in a very uh, safe mode because, uh, safe manner because uh, the machine is, ad uh, is adjusted to your anatomy. So uh, the height, the, the seat, oh, it's all adjusted to your, uh, to your anatomy. But most of all, this machine affords you to train also with this viscous mode. The viscous mode is extremely interesting because uh, it's more gentle. It, is, uh, it can be very gentle if you want, but it can, it can be also tough if you want. It, it depends how, on your strength capabilities. This uh, range, this uh, uh, ability to adapt to the uh, user's requirement is not easily found in, in many other machines. So uh, I uh, strongly suggest that uh, this viscous mode 
uh, is, uh, is uh, used by the older population because it seems particularly useful. But also, I think the uh, elastic mode is also interesting because elastic mode enables us to train plyometrically. And plyometric contractions seem to be very efficient for uh, developing muscle power uh, in, in old age. And in old age, we do need mostly muscle power. We need muscle power for getting up from a chair or to uh, walk to a bus. And so by the possibility of increasing muscle power using the elastic mode, in other words, using a plyometric con uh, contractions seems particularly suited for the elderly. Should the 1.5 eccentric increment be extended to different movements to achieve the same effects? Uh, well, rather than um, different movements, I think what is meant different machines. Um, I think this is this is what we found uh, in uh, for the leg press. Uh, I think the the same would have the, a similar approach would have to be tested uh, on different machines like the uh, knee extension machine or. Uh, in the exercise with the upper limbs. But the concept is, is this. You need to increase the eccentric load on top of the concentric load. Um, so uh, I think future studies should address this point. But what is certain, the eccentric load will have to be greater than the concentric load. But this will depend from joint to joint. Next question is, are there other machines available providing the features you, you presented? Well, in terms of the uh, overloading during the <coughs> eccentric phase, yes, you, you could achieve that <coughs> with other machines, but not automatically. Uh, you, you would have to add load physically to perform um, uh, overloading during the eccentric phase. Uh, there is no machine in the market that enables you to overload the, uh, the, the, the machine during the eccentric phase, except, of course, uh, with uh, um, isoconnected dynamometers, but then uh, th that's a different uh, concept. So uh, this for the eccentric load. It's certainly other machines enable to, to uh, train with the viscous mode and with the elastic mode, with this range of uh, um, features, certainly not. There is no other machines in the market. Tilt, uh, the time under tension and EMG. Could you explain again this relationship during viscous contraction? Yes. In other words, um, the time under tension, uh, how does this affect the EMG activity? Well, uh, if um, the EMG activity will increase the greater the time under tension. So in other words, if we want to achieve uh, high uh, EMG activity, high neural drive, we'll have to increase the time under tension. This, so the time in which the muscle is activated. And, and this is a, a, an essential feature of these machines, of the biostrength machines, that enables us to decide precisely the time and the tension that we desire. Would a 10 second isometric contraction break the motor unit activation? Would a 10 second isometric contraction break the motor unit activation? I'm not sure I understand the question uh, to break the motor unit and, uh, activation. Uh, I probably, and this refers to fatigue, I suppose, that if uh, the, the contraction lasts a long time, perhaps um, motor unit discharge would decrease. Yes, the, this is likely, but then this is the common feature of any long contraction. But again, when we train, we never train, unless one does a specific type of training, we never train with isometric contractions. We uh, do uh, 
uh, a series of co concentric, in other words, shortening and lengthening contractions. Um, we have a, a tiny isometric phase between the concentric and eccentric phase as the weight reaches the, the maximum displacement, but this certainly is not a cause of fatigue per se. Uh, the fatigue is contracted during repeated um, concentric and eccentric contraction as it normally happens with training. And this is the, the one of the pre uh, principles of training to exhaust you. Have a great afternoon. This concludes today's webinar.